We'll do a quick review of, of last week and, and then dive into this week. Um, so last week we, we talked about Nehemiah was, uh, was doing a great job building the wall. They, they made great progress, you know, had a little bit of complaining, um, but had a lot of opposition. You know, some of the neighbors weren't happy driving down the property values, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but no, the, the um, Sambalat and um, Tobiah, yes, thank you. And then we, we meet their, their buddy who makes the third of the three stooges, I guess them this week. So they were um, trying to do everything they could to um, slow down the progress. And, and with the idea, I'm sure that with a little bit of opposition, they'd probably just quit. Um, so, you know, they were, they were thwarted. Nehemiah was prepared. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, Nehemiah just kind of ignored them a few times, which was kind of the thing to do. Um, you know, we talked about also last week that, you know, Nehemiah's true call was to, um, not just to rebuild the wall, but he was called to rebuild a community. You know, the wall was, was the project that was going to bring the community together. So, you know, we, we talked last week about the, the, the economic reforms he instituted with the usury laws, uh, the unfair uh, usury laws that, that were, quite frankly, you know, uh, unlawful under the Mosaic, the De Deuteronomic law. So, um, you know, I, I think that was um, probably went a long way to build um, a lot of trust um, with people in the community, um, as well as what were some of the other things he did to build community while we're on that topic? What were some of the other things? Do you remember what we talked about? Um, well, I mean, to put how about the stuff in, in chapter five about, for, you know, he had you know, some of the young people taking advantage of others that, you know, charging interest and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. Did away with that. I think that built a little good community. You know, and he, and he, he led by example uh, in terms of, you know, food rationing and, and food sharing. Uh, he did not use his um, position to uh, host a lavish banquet for his leadership team. You know, they, they pretty much, you know, he, he gave all his food uh, out to the people, to his people. Um, so, you know, he was a sacrificial, you know, he employed sacrificial leadership, which was, you know, important uh, to build trust. So, you know, and, and let's and think about this. In the end of chapter five, you know, we're we're a month and a half into this pro project. I mean, he's 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 moving fast. They're getting the wall going. It's things are happening quickly. So I wanted to to start today's lesson, um, and and dive into a couple of cult, you know, a couple of things to help us again as we are in the midst of a. Of a Lose my mind. I apologize. You know, a, a little more in-depth study of, of the scripture you know, where we look at context and things. I wanted to kind of take a look at the timeline um, of, of where we are in, in the Old Testament. Um, going back up to the beginning of it, you know, the Babylonians um, invaded the Judean region and, and conquered the Assyrians in 612 and then slowly took over the rest of the region in Jerusalem and started deporting the Jews in about 605. So that, that's kind of when the deportation started. It started, you know, that first diaspora a group living in Babylon. Um, 586 
were when the Jerusalem walls were actually destroyed. So, you know, 20 years, 20-ish years later, um, the walls were destroyed. And then about 50 years after that, uh, Cyrus the Persian conquers Babylon, and he reverses the, ex the exile. It starts uh, offering to return Jews to Judea. And, and many take him up on it. Many don't, but, but many do. So, so uh, in 539, people start returning to Judea and Jerusalem, in the area around Jer Jerusalem. 516, the temple is, uh, is rebuilt. Um, my head, um, Zechariah and Hezekiah, maybe we're, we're leaving that. So, you know, they had the priorities in place, they want they were going to rebuild the temple. Now, that's about as good as it got for a long time. Was it, the temple was there, but they really, you know, they hadn't really gotten back into. True temple worship and obedience to the law. So, in 458, you know, 75 ish years later, Ezra returns from Babylon to reinstate the law. So, to with the people that are there, uh, you know, he's he is working to reinstate temple law, you know, the, the Mosaic law. And then 13 years later is when Nehemiah shows up to build, rebuild his wall. So, this first part, the first two from 605 to 586, or 539, is the Babylonian period of the exile. And then in 539, you know, we enter the Persian period, which lasts for about 200 years, until about 330, when the area begins the Greek period. Uh, so, we we'll, we'll, Go into that at this point, but um, so that, that gives us some context of of the timeline of where we are. Um, I wanted to share. This is I've got an archaeological Bible, and it, it has some cool things in it from time to time, and a lot of contextual information. So I kind of wanted to read a little bit about this this post exile, this Persian period. Um, it says, and this is kind of in reference to the background for Nehemiah chapter 7. It says, the post-exilic period, which covers over 500 years, can be conveniently divided into five periods. Persian, Greek, Hasmonean, Roman, and Herodian. In 539, 538 BC, Cyrus the Persian defeated the Babylonians and reversed the policy of depopulating areas and scattering people into foreign lands. Almost immediately thereafter, he allowed the exiled Israelites to return to their homeland under the leadership of Shezbazar, um, which we read more about him in Ezra. Uh, the Cyrus Cylinder provides important extra-biblical confirmation. So that was a document that they found called the Cyrus Cylinder. It talks about that. Many Jews opted to remain in the lands to which they had been exiled, though maintaining their religious and ethnic identity. This phenomenon known as the dispersion of the Jews had become an irreversible social reality. However, the Old Testament exilic and post-exilic narratives, with the exception of the book of Esther, focuses on the challenges and crises facing the returnees. The first major challenge was the rebuilding of the temple in the face of external opposition and internal neglect. Its restoration was a prerequisite for the reinstatement of God's presence and blessings, and a strong priesthood was necessary to reinstitute local, local worship according to prescribed norms. Stirred into action by the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, sorry, Haggai, not Hezekiah, um, with Persian, and with Persian sponsorship, the Persian-appointed governor, Zerubbabel, and the high priest Joshua successfully completed the project, dedicating the temple in about 516-515 BC. 
Another challenge was the threat of assimilation and idolatry. With Persian endorsement, Ezra returned to Jerusalem in 458 BC. He confronted the people, led them in confession of their unfaithfulness to God, and later fulfilled his commission to teach the book of the law of Moses to the people, uh, which we'll talk about next week in Nehemiah. A third significant challenge was the fortification of Jerusalem. In 445, Nehemiah, royal cupbearer to the Persian monarch, appealed to Artaxerxes I on Jerusalem's behalf. Artaxerxes appointed Nehemiah governor of Judea, funded his return to Jerusalem, and provided building materials. Despite considerable opposition, Nehemiah and the returnees succeeded in their mission. The dedication of the wall was accompanied by extensive reading from the law and a call for covenant renewal. This period of revival was apparently short-lived, however. When Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, perhaps in 433, 432-ish, he discovered that the priests and people alike had become negligent in their worship. The Persian king's endorsement and support of religious activities in Judea is consistent with their interest in temple communities in Babylon, Syria, Asia Minor, Armenia, Phoenicia, and elsewhere. So he goes on to talk a little bit more about that, some of those areas. But, um, so again, that kind of falls in line a little bit with, with the timeline and, and um, you know, that continuing narrative of the Israelites in the Old Testament where they are enslaved by Egyptians or is enslaved by sin, have a comeback, it's all great, and then they fall back, and then there's a comeback, and then, you know, so it's, it's, that, it's that roller coaster ride that, that, you know, anybody that's been through Disciple Bible Study, you know, you, you, we've been through that. Um, so, thoughts, comments, questions on anything up to this point about the last two weeks or anything you've come across that you want to share? One of the things that I know was Nehemiah and Ezra, they split the leadership so that they probably both had a following or whatever and said to Nehemiah, say, well, I'm it. And but he sort of shared it with uh, where Nehemiah, one would build the wall and the other would build the faith and get the law back in and do all of that. So they shared so that I'm sure some of the people liked one and some liked the other, but since they were working together, it made a larger group. Were they together or were they about a generation apart? No, they were, they were a crossover. As a matter of fact, we, we will talk about Ezra next week uh, as part of this. Um, Ezra returned to Jerusalem about 13 years earlier than oh, Nehemiah. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. Um, and there's no indication that they had any contact, that, or at least that I have come across, that they, that they had any relationship when they were in Babylon. But I don't know. Um, so um, the book of Ezra is confusing because it does, it, there, it's got some wide time frames and gaps in, in, in the book of it. So um, parts of the book of Ezra are a generation apart from this time frame. I think what threw me but was Ezra, I was looking at the, when the temple was rebuilt, but Ezra was not part of that no, project. No. He was, okay, that's what threw me. I'm, my yeah, man, and, and that's what makes Ezra confusing because it talks about the temple rebuilding, but this was predating. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, as a matter of fact, the, I think the last, um, the last sentence of, Chapter seven. No, it didn't. Never mind. It just it was on my digital version. It bled over. Um, so yes, we'll talk about Ezra next week. In that relationship, Larry. Thanks for the foreshadowing. You were foreshadowing next week. Um, I'm always. <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but we'll just you know we're just gonna run with it. I tried to look for the night, and I said, what cotton picking chapters are you on? And I couldn't find the sheet that showed them, so I looked, like, I looked ahead a little bit, and I said, this don't sound like it. You know, and actually, uh, it, it may be something um, we might look at doing Ezra 
next as a study? I don't know. We, we, we can look and see. Um, you don't necessarily have to study them together, but it could be interesting. So let's dive into chapter six, which I entitled, Watch Your Back. Um, so, you know, the neighbors are up in arms again. Um, and now they're getting a little more serious and a little more devious. And they're really trying to lure Nehemiah. You know, obviously he's created a pretty nice safety net around himself and his people. Um, so you know, they're trying to lure him out. You know, come out and meet with us. You know, let, let's hash this out and, you know, come to a conclusion. You know, make a, make a nice agreement. And, you know, Nehemiah was having none of that. Um, and then they tried to, I'm trying to think, you know, they'd shame him into meeting them in the temple or appeal to his um, well, they had a religious sensibility. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, so why did, I mean, why were they so, why did they crank it up? I mean, obviously, the wall's going up. There's not going to be much they can do about it uh, at that point. You know, the wall was going to get finished. Um, what were they so afraid of? I mean, there was no army. Nehemiah didn't have an army. There was, you know, he had, enough, had a lot of people building this wall, but. You know, at the beginning, back in like chapter three and four, so they were kind of making fun of him, you know, you know, what are you going to do with a bunch of old rubble like that? And now they see it, you know, coming together. And yeah. it's, you know, it's pretty close to being finished, except for the door being hung and stuff. So, you know, I would think they'd probably get a little nervous as this may get serious pretty soon. Yeah. Um, I think they're, I think they realize God's been helping him, though. He has some. Well, power up and over and above and afraid he's going to be king. Yeah. So they they can, set himself up as a king. Right. If they can cause him to doubt himself or discredit him with yeah. the people somehow. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> if they if they could pull him away or discredit him, then you know, they'll use they would use that as an example for everybody else that, you know, he was a fluke or you know, not a good leader. What do you think about this idea that, that they were, that they understood that God was at work in this and that they were, that they feared, you know, that God was protecting Nehemiah and, you know, how, how what, what would we call that? How would they have any frame of reference to fear God? I guess is my question. Maybe, I don't even know if they realized it was God, per se, our God, Nehemiah's God, a power. Um, from their perspective, they realized he relied on his God, and they may have been afraid that there was more to it than they, they thought. Mm -hmm. It was moving so quickly, and it seemed yeah, to I mean, overcome obstacles. It was like obstacles. a bunch of rubble, right? Mm -hmm. And basically a bunch of rubble, and, and, and then, then basically in 52 days. Like a, a cartoon. It's just so bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah. think about it. It lay in ruins from 586 to 445. Yeah. So that's, what, 140 years? That's 55 and 86. Yeah, 141 years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it lay in ruins for 100, almost 100, a century and a half, and then less than 60 days you know, they've got the wall raised back up to a respectable original height i don't know whatever but a, a respectable fortifiable height well looking at wayne's pictures the the blocks or boulders or whatever were i'm assuming just heaps they weren't the best of tools to use to make a wall i don't think so yeah. Was this prophesied before it happened? Or did he just kind of come out of left field and say, let's go make a wall back there? It, um, yes, and not really can you can really come out of left field, but yes, Ezekiel, um, I'm trying to think some of the other prophets that were in the exile, 
Um, uh, I'm just trying to think. Ezekiel, Eli was Elijah? I'm trying to if these guys anyway, yes, it was prophesied that they would return and that Jerusalem would be rebuilt. So I would assume these guys had heard that kind of thing over the years and probably Possibly. wanted to prevent that kind of thing from happening. You know, like we talked about, that the uh, Moabites, which was Tobiah, I think, and the, the Ammonites and the um, Samaritans, you know, they all had history with the Jews in this region uh, that went way back, I mean, to way back to Moses um, and, and the, the stories from Deuteronomy. So, you know, they had the stories in their tradition of the children of Israel and their God and, and the things that their God, you know, did to their people. So I think they had that. Uh, whether they understood it or not, uh, I think. Chris is on to something there, you know. Um, but but I think there was a true a true fear because again they had a shared tradition in that region um, that, go, that went way back. Do we know were they pagans or they weren't a Jewish sect of some kind, right? No, I mean the Samaritans were the closest. You know, they were formerly Jews, but yeah, the Ammonites and the Moabites were. Baal worshippers, yeah, basically. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah, uh, the Moabites for sure were Baal worshippers. And so we yeah, have, and, and uh, just help me understand. So we have J Jerusalem, we have the Wall, which was once a mighty kingdom, and now it's coming back. And then you have these tribes, two or three or multiple tribes around yeah. that had coalesced with a, you know, an alliance to try to interfere with the uh, the rising back up of Jerusalem. Yeah, and, and, and you also had, you know, Jewish families and settlements that were outside of Jerusalem All as well. Judea, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, the, that's pretty much the situation. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think they feared that, that God would make Nehemiah the king and, you know, their life was about to, you know, they were about to go to war, they were about to relive some of this some of the history um, I have a question about shoot. the part where they were afraid that uh, Nehemiah would become king um, it's in uh, chapter 7 verse 11 I guess or no it's 6 yeah. verse 11 where they're talking about um, that he'd been hired to intimidate me so that I would um, commit a sin by doing this and then they uh, be able to give him a bad time, whatever. So the sin would be to set himself up as king? Yeah. Okay. Uh, which, but there were kings, so... It, and it was also more of a political ploy to, to set him up that Nehemiah was going to create a kingdom to separate from Artaxerxes and rebel. And this was, I think, part of the episode where they were trying to lure him right. into the temple. Right. And right. I think that would have been the sin. He's not a priest. No. So he wouldn't have been oh, allowed so into that the temple. Was it, but I, yeah. I didn't understand what the yeah. sin Yeah, I think. He would have lost yeah, was. Oh, yeah, okay. he would have been seen as an he unclean, as not a priest. Okay. So okay. he's unclean, so he can't really go in the temple. And if he does, he's going to be seen as a coward okay. and right. unclean. I understand and, that part, but okay. yeah. so he can't, he just can't go in there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. I didn't so yeah, they, they wanted to discredit him with the people, exactly what Rob uh -huh. said. Okay. And then also create a an illusion for Artaxerxes that hey, you you're about to have a rebellion on your side. Mm -hmm. Send us some help, and we'll help put this down. Mm -hmm. uh, we we you know. Mark, do you think like what was what was influencing the opposition? I mean, was it mostly about power and money? Yeah, uh, definitely because power. the governors they had the ability to tax, right? Yeah, and they sort of had control of, of the people around Jerusalem uh, as long as the walls were down, right? I think pretty much. Um, I mean, they had. To, I don't know what the economic the walls go up. They have sort of loose control. The walls down, they have more control over them. Yeah, I don't know what kind of economic arrangements they had throughout the region, but 
definitely in their areas. I mean, I mean, there had to be a reason why they didn't want it to go up. Yeah. A lost power. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just that simple. Yeah, you've got these outlying tribes, and they're all rivals with each other, I'm assuming. And Jerusalem was once a mighty kingdom. Now it's becoming a mighty kingdom again. And they're going to, could end up ruling over the yeah. whole Judean territory like they did before. They didn't want that. Right. You know, because I don't, they're, they're going to become our overlords. We're going to become their, you know, their serfs. And, and I think that's what it was all about. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's, again, part of what our job with this is to translate this part of the story into, you know, what kind of opposition do we face in our faith life, in our lives? Um, and then how did, how did Nehemiah kind of remain steadfast? Um, kind of what was his, what was his formula for remaining steadfast and, and what can we take from that? So let's, let's start with the opposition. I mean, obviously, you know, I don't, I'm not afraid of my neighbor in the cul-de-sac, you know, starting a, a war with me over our backyard fence. So what kind of, you know, what kind of opposition do we face in our faith life? It's kind of real and tangible like this. Well, there's this thing called the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's pretty distracting. Yeah. There's all kinds, I mean, stumbling blocks everywhere. You know, and every time, you know, you get distracted by one of the stumbling blocks, it's, it's sort of like you drop the stake between you and God, you know, it sort of separates you instead of brings you closer. Yeah, that's, that's a, I like that thought, you know, because one of the things I thought of was, you know, the people that, for example, if, if you had a particular calling or, or to do something in your life and um, you know, the people around you weren't supportive and didn't understand it and didn't, you know, understand where it came from, you know, how they can be opposing you, not forcible, forcibly, but just by not supporting you, that, that kind of a that passive aggressive, I guess, opposition. Um, I think, I mean, anytime you want to disassociate from something that the world values and holds up, you know, as success, a measure of success or whatever. Um, I mean, think, I think people can be well-intentioned thinking, we're helping you course correct. You're doing something that's impractical, you know, whatever. Yes. <clears throat> and it's really counter to what God is wanting, you know, but they view it as you're being destructive or whatever, and you're making these bad, wrong decisions. And so I think that's, Definitely one way I see opposition. So how did how did Nehemiah kind of stay steadfast and on point and on task um, and, and, and kind of fight through this opposition? By making himself an example. Okay. To start with. All right. So he continued to lead mm -hmm. by example. Continued. Chapter six, verse nine, they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for this work and it will not be completed. But I pray, now strengthen my hands. So he prayed. Mm -hmm. and he didn't, well, he didn't pray, take this cup away from me, get me out of this. He said, strengthen me. Okay. Yes, he could have retired back home and had a really good life. Yeah. Yeah, you can say, well, we got the wall halfway up. It's yeah. good enough. It's, it's done. I think he stayed very focused on his position. Okay. In other words, he knew that everybody was looking at him as a leader and, and watching what he does and how he handles um, situations. So, um, you know, I, I forget the exact, but it's like when he was being tempted to go into the temple. You know, a person like me in my position. I can't do I'm that. Not there, I can't do that. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, absolutely. So he, he stayed focused. Um, think back to, to his original um, 
you know, his the, chapter one, you know, his original calling. What were some of the what was what was his process in 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 discerning this his call? You know, this this call to go back to Jerusalem. I'm gonna put focus and obedience. Mm -hmm. So what else? Fellowship with God. I mean, he was spending time. I mean, we're saying praying, but yeah. yeah, I guess that. Remember the word we used was patience. He was, he was mm -hmm. patient. And I think he was patient in this situation because he, he didn't do anything rash. He didn't respond to the threat mm -hmm. with, with, uh, with, you know, a, a, a counter threat. So he was patient and thoughtful. Another one that jumped out at me was chapter 7, verse 2. He says, I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother, and I can't pronounce these names, Hanine, along with Hananine, the commander of the citadel, because they were men of integrity and feared God more than this, most men do. So he selected leaders that had integrity and feared God. Around the good leaders, the good people. And he was looking for those particular skill sets, not the art of the deal. Yeah. Put a pin in that. Let's come back to that. That's a good one. But he surrounded himself with good people and good leaders. What else? Well, and he was careful because he made sure the gates were closed, open after daylight, closed before <coughs> sunset, basically. So that there wasn't a chance for... Something. To get those common sins. Mm -hmm. He either never told us about it or he never was rattled. I mean, he was just studying and studying and studying. Mm -hmm. He may not have wanted to tell us about being rattled. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly didn't mention it. Kept it inside. Yeah, I mean, think about it. He, he, you know, this is a 90 day process because he spent a month praying about uh No, I'm sorry. He spent four months. Four months, yeah. This is my mind. Sorry. He spent four months praying for the and preparing to even talk to the king about starting this project. And half that time he spent now on property rebuilding the wall. So, you know, in that, in that four months, I think he built that that preparation was that steadfastness, that thoughtfulness, that patience. Um, you know, kept him focused in, you know, on being obedient. Did he um, did he ever tell these people that the king had actually sent him? Yeah. Um, did, he, did he? Was he? I can't remember if he opened. That him. was initial. I told them that. I think we we assumed that when he entered the land, he had these. He took these letters. And they saw that Art of Xerxes had. And the arrival of all the building supplies probably took right. him out too. Right. And the yeah. people who were just coming to help. Too. Yeah. But, but so he, he yeah, and you know, again, that's part of that preparation and good common sense that hey, I'm, I've got my permits in order. You know, I was thinking about that earlier. <clears throat> so when the king sent him or allowed him to go, he, he sent troops with him, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I never did hear anything else we really about whatever happened to the troops. They just dropped him off and headed back. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> they didn't stick yeah. around for any action. Uh, yes. Yeah, my understanding was that they, were, they were just to keep get him there or something. A convoy. Get him yeah. there and get, and get out of Dodge. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. Go you on your own. Good on yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Exactly. But the king did provide you know, material support, right? Yeah. I mean, there was money and, and building, and the building supplies. supplies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, and I, and I think that, that part of that, that four month um, prayer time, you know, prepared him to face that opposition. So it's, it wasn't something that he may have knew was coming or, you know, uh, had seen was coming, but he was prepared for it. And I got a, I got a feeling he knew that there was going to be some opposition. I mean, he, he's, he was in the royal court. He was involved in the, the politics of the kingdom. I mean, he, you know, he knew the score. So what, what was the time frame from the time that he started the wall to finish? 52 days. Not very long. Yeah. 52 days. Mm -hmm. They had good commands. Well, they got the wall up in 52 <laughs> days. <laughs> And, the, and then they immediately the just opened the door and 50,000 people. No. 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 So, so how long did it take to get people from 
Um, let's talk about that. Let's jump into chapter seven and dive into that. Um, so chapter seven, I titled, Who's Your Neighbor? Um, so, also, who's your mama? <laughs> who's your mama, yeah. Uh, so, Nehemiah um, got the wall up 52 days. What did he do next? He, he, there are kind of three things we, we see in the beginning of chapter 7 that he did that we've kind of already alluded to, two of them. He set up gatekeepers. Singers. Yeah, I mean, you got some entertainment. You got to have some entertainment. You got to have, you know, on the wall, you got to have happy hour. Uh, so, Ron had mentioned the appointed leaders. And notice he wasn't one of them. Et cetera. It's a great point. Uh, safety procedures for the wall, like Jana was talking about. You create a register of people. Took a census. Yeah, so that's what that's kind of where Steve was going with the census. Let's talk about the safety procedures for just a second. Um, he said that you know we're only going to open the do the gates when the sun is high. What? Why? What? What do you think the rationale behind that was? Everybody be awake. Everybody be awake. Good point. Everybody's up. Yeah, the, the study, my study Bible says that in common in that time, the, at sunrise, the, the gates would come open because there's all these vendors that are going to come in and set up tent markets. And they want to be there as soon as they possibly can to start, you know, to have their, their wares ready to sell, you know, their produce, fish, whatever they have. Yeah. So that when people start gathering, they're already there. He's going, no, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is wait till the sun's really up high and everybody's awake and alert. Then the merchants, the outsiders, can come in. Yeah, so we can kind of control. Sort of be on your guard. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and, and historically, um, you know, if you were going to be attacked, it would be in the night or during the early morning at sunrise. Uh, again, when everybody's asleep. So you know, there, there's that common sense. So it's, there's there's an economic. Rationale, you know, there's there's a, a defense rationale. Um, so, you know, again, I think he's he's just employing some some good leadership common sense that we're we're trying to build community. You know, now he's in community building mode. Um, so, what's why why what's the deal with the census? What's why did uh, why did he need to have a have an accounting of all these people? He needs to get some people on the living in there. You really think there's nobody living there, right? He's trying to well, build a plan to get folks to come back and yeah. build their houses and live there. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some, but some were. Some were. Not very many. But, but a seems, lot were not, right? They right. moved all to other places right. and scattered. <laughs> and he's trying to find out the sort of, uh, you know, that's what he put it, uh, some of these families had pure yeah. given dinners. Dude, the ones that came from the exile or been right, exiled. Right, exactly. right. Yeah. yeah, these were Jews. Yeah, these and and to, be, to be a Jew, you have to, your genealogy has to go back to Abraham. You have to be able to trace your, that's why I said, who's your mama? Because yeah. if you can't trace your genealogy back to Abraham, you can't be a Jew. And so that's why this is important because he's saying these are these are going to be bona fide Jews. They can live here. They're going to be citizens in good standing. Yeah, because what is a dumb question? But how did you do that back then? Yeah, it's a huh? it's, you don't. I mean, how, yeah, how would you? It's how many a, generations would that be? It, well, you can't. I mean, it was just it was a legend. You take the word for it. Yeah. And, yeah. And there's a provision, apparently there's a provision around it too, because if you're not say, oh, well, I lost my genealogical records, then you can convene a council of priests and they can say, okay, we believe you. So there's a way, there is a way around it. But I don't they think- They had a procedure to resolve it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the, here's the point to that is, he's not only trying to rebuild a community, he's trying to rebuild a community of faith for worship. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, 
you know, that's where <clears> this, who's, not, obviously, who's your mama? That's why that's important. Now, the time frame, I don't have any idea how long. He, he, this is over, this starts to take over a, a couple of years because he had ultimately goes back to Babylon and then comes back in like 432-ish time frame. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know what that, I'll have to look that up. So he didn't just open the gates and these 42,000 people yeah. kind of came walking in with their servants. And and, and all. Yeah. I think too, I mean, it's an intentional way to get them to connect with their identity again too, right? Yes. Going through that process of having to take an account of their lineage. Yeah. It's a pretty small area for that many people too. Yeah. Exactly where they were living. Well, again, as Mark said, not everybody's going to be inside the city walls. You're going to have the farmers or out in the community, but they'll come into the city if they're under attack. Um, that makes sense. So he's trying to build a community of faith, get people to reconnect with their faith. What else? Why else is it important for him to, to try to to get more of these people to? Um, to come back in and, and reclaim their homes inside the city and, and rebuild. There's some practical, going back to his practicality, there's practical reasons. Again, building community. Yeah, they need, they need, they need commerce. Yeah. And then what else? Yeah. Strength in numbers. So safety in numbers. So the more places that are, the more neighborhoods that are populated, the more neighborhood watches that they can have on that part of the wall um, to to keep them safe. Um, so so again, you know, there's there's a lot of layers to what Nehemiah. Is trying to do. Uh, this is a, a, I pulled this out of a commentary that uh, Matthew Henry, uh, Matthew Henry's Bible commentary, which, you know, dates back to the 1750s, but is still one of the, you know, um, most used commentaries, even though he was a little bit racist. We won't get into that tonight. Um, but he, and again, this is kind of written in uh, a little bit of that um, English uh, vernacular. Um, he thought fit to take an account of the people that he might find what families had formerly had their settlement in Jerusalem, but were now removed into the country that he might bring them back and what families could in any other way be influenced by their religion or by their business to come and rebuild the house, the houses in Jerusalem and dwell in them. So little reason have we to wish that we may be placed alone in the earth or in Jerusalem itself, that much of our safety and comfort depends upon our neighbors and friends. The more the stronger, the more the merrier. <laughs> um, so, What do you think about that? What do you think about Nehemiah? How, how does a cupbearer who, who's, I mean, he's, he's involved in, he's involved in politics, where he's from, you know, more from a security standpoint, he's, he's kind of part of the security detail. Um, where does he get this skill set? Because that, that intrigues me. I, I, I've always been intrigued by Nehemiah. You know, he's kind of like the, I'm trying to think some of the great engineers, the Henry Ford of his time, you know, that had processes and in, in, innovation for getting things done. So he was in the court and was the cupbearer. That he had to be a lot of meals or a lot of the different people in the kingdom were there talking to the king about building, about people, about taxes, about 
this about that. And so he, if he was just listen, mm -hmm. he probably heard a lot that he could put all together and when the time came, he could use. Yeah, absolutely buy that. Mm -hmm. And you see, he was up to his point, he was at the center of one of, of the center of the court of one of the civilization's greatest empires ever, the Persian Empire. And so he, he was, at, you know, at the center of the universe at that point, really. So, and I think the word, I still stand by what I said a couple of weeks ago. I think it's not a simple cut bear. I think he had a, had a role in that court that was much grace greater than just the cut bear. He was a steward. He was in charge of the, the you know, sections of the Royal Palace, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. I, so I, I think he was it. pretty high up. Yeah. Yeah, the cup bears, not just a cup bear, right? I mean, they're, no, that's what I think. I that's what I read. Is there, yeah. they're like, he probably close, would have got tasted like the food. He, was, he had a, he had a team. team of people yeah, that I'm were sure. probably tasting the food. Yeah, I think you uh, said he was like, uh, uh, Bates and Dow, not Bates, but, uh, Carson and Carson, Dow Nabby, you know, Nabby, yeah. the Dow Nabby fans. You know, he ran the palace. Um, they had 40, we counted all those numbers together. There were like 40,000, 42,000. People, but there were 7,300 servants, which that's they had a lot of you know, and they had some well, 200 like, singers, yeah. And I don't you know, that's some good music going on. That's where, that's where uh, Nashville music, I guess, yeah. started from <laughs> over there. the Israeli Motown. Um, I, guess, I guess that was, uh, in the way I interpreted that, I mean, this is a question mark, I may be totally off base, but that was part. Part of the the worship. Yes, yeah. Yeah. you know, maybe it's not really there for entertainment as much as it's no. the uh, uh, choir. Yeah, the choir. Yeah, thank you. The choir. <laughs> so sort of. Yeah. Um, I, I think he was. I think Nehemiah was, aside from being able to see all these things going on and have a, having a role in the in the um, the empire, I think he had an extremely analytical mind. And I can just see all the pieces filtering down in his brain, just like a computer, mm -hmm. and um, knowing full well what all he needed and knowing how to attack various problems. I don't think it would be difficult for him at all to come up with this recipe or any recipe. Yeah. Um, so here's, here's, here's how you know, I think we can translate Nehemiah's experience. Um, to, to our lives is, is, you know, that I think this tells us to pay attention to what's going on around us because, you know, God has put us in a situation quite possibly to, to develop a skill set, to develop an understanding, to be, to develop networks, to develop relationships that he will use somehow, maybe even 180 degrees differently than where you are now for his will down the road. Um, and, and I think that's kind of one of the big things I get out of studying Nehemiah is, um, and again, I think it goes, all, it goes back to that, you know, he was prayerful and patient and was, was able to, to, to shut everything out, else out and, and hear God clearly in, in this calling. And, and, you know, I like what Chris says. These things probably started clicking into place as he was like, you know, he started addressing these problems. Oh, well, you know, this is just like what I saw, you know, blah, 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 being, you know, or this is something like we had to address when we had, you know, they, they brought us the wrong order of land. And you know the king was wanting goats or whatever. So um, you know I I think that's one of the those major things we can pull from from Nehemiah is you know pay attention because God may have you in a weird place or in a common place or in a boring dull place in your life to prepare you for something else. It, it remind there's an old men's Bible study book, and you guys have read it, is called Halftime from Success to Significance. Have y'all ever read that? It's yeah. a really good book. It's, and it's good for anybody, but it's, it's particularly a men's Bible study. Because it sounds like it's got sports analogy. It's, it, halftime is what it is. And those of us that are of a certain age in here, you know, you hit midlife, and 
they had success, you know, you've made money, you've got children, you know, you've got a house, got all this stuff. But the idea is, okay, you're, you're transitioning from success to significance. What are you gonna do with your life now? How are, what's your legacy really gonna be? How are you gonna make an impact? What's your ministry, really? Okay, yeah, and I think okay. he had one of those moments. I think he said, okay, I've got a great gig here. You know, life is really good, uh, but the Jews need me, and I can do this. I have the wherewithal to do this, and so I'm gonna go do this. What was the name of that again, Halftime? From Success to Significance. I think he had a midlife crisis. Well, I don't know what we're talking about. I think he had a midlife epiphany. Yeah, yeah. Did I get a Porsche? Porsche died. Well, the, uh, the midlife crisis hotline is 1-800-PORSHA. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? What else can we take from um, this, these two chapters in Nehemiah or what we've taken to, to date that we haven't talked about? If you look at, if I did the math right, 605 where they left and went off and that 66 years, mm -hmm. Was that longer than that? Uh, 66 anyway, years to win. Until they started coming back. But they were 66 years, they were living in a different place. Their whole life was messed up. Their religion was messed up. Their guidance and family was messed up. And if you look at 2018 and take 66 years away, it goes back to 1952. And what was life wow. in this country? And, what was religion and family, education and things like in 1952. And if we tried, That's a good point, Larry. you know, to get, I think what he says is he found broken lives. They, they came back, but they didn't have that 1952 <laughs> way of living. They had the 2018, so he's trying to get them. They all had to cell where, phones and TV. Brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, that's a that's a great correlation because you know that that's one of the major problems that we face in the church is that we're the mainline church is set up and equipped to serve a community that existed in the 1950s. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to jump on that soapbox because I do that Monday through Friday, <laughs> nine to midnight. Um, so, next week, we're going to dive into uh, chapters 8 and 9 and spend some time uh, and get to know Ezra. So, when you're, um, when you're um, doing some research, um, let's, let's, let's dig into Ezra and see what we can find out about Ezra, the person, not the rock man. What was Ezra... What was that? Thing? I don't think it was Ezra, but <laughs> something, something Ezra. Anyway, um, and then in chapter nine, you know, we we, we start getting into um, some worship um, and some introduced to some names and places. So so check those out. See what we you know. See what you can come up with. Um, so these are, and again, this is where we will meet Ezra and make that connection between Ezra and Nehemiah. Are we going to confess important. their sins? It says chapter nine, the people confess their sins. Are we going to do that? Next optional. Week? It's very optional. Only if you, will we have long enough time? We're, we're not going to take our time limit. Yeah. 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 Let me stop the recording now.